Hi folks, a couple of minutes before two, Monday afternoon, if you're there and online, uh, shoot your name forward so I can know who's present, please. can take account of that. Hi, Nathan. Wow. Brooke, Stephen. Kira, good. Hope you had a nice weekend. Sure was pretty. I got a lot of good work on outside doing. How nice. Hey, Jessica and Brianna. Brianna. Uh, what was the last thing we talked about the other day in lecture? Hi, Shakira. Sessions. See her, Jessica. You're here. Good. Okay, we'll get to that in just a minute. I just want to do a brief review, make sure I've covered stuff. Thank you, Brianna. Hi, Kenya. Understand North Carolina has gone to a what do they call it shelter in home number of infections are increasing. I wonder if we'll do that too. Got a plan on maybe being at home. Hey Paul, hey Ashley. Uh, Dominique.
Hey, Jasmine. Good. Jordan. Hey, Indonesia. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Now, let me uh, ask you a couple of things. I don't want to make, I don't want to skip anything that um, you need to know. But if you would look back on page 358, 358. Okay, I assume you've located that page. And in the second column, we covered one, three, and four, did we not? How about it, Kenya? Did we cover that? 358 over in the second column about acetylcholinesterase breaks down the acetylcholine. Number three, calcium is pumped back into the terminal cisterni and troponin and trompo tropomyosin move back in their position so that the muscle relaxes. Did we cover that? Oh, that's good. You remember one step. <laughs> that indicates we probably covered that. Anybody else want to comment on that? Paul, anybody else? Let's move over to page 369. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, we know we're going to get there to 374. I just wanted to make sure we had covered some things. Look, if you would, on 369. Good. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that.
So look on page 369 at those motor units, if you would. Hello, Anisha. We'll review in just a second on 369. And I don't know what the asterisk and a backsplash mean. So you look at 1025. Figure 1025 speaks about the motor unit. So we talked, I believe, about um, gross muscle movement versus fine muscle movement, like in writing or playing a musical instrument. But I also want you to realize that in your biceps or wherever, you've got a number of motor units, and you use only the motor units that you need to lift. I think I used this pen as an example. Very light to pick up. If I had a five-pound weight, I would have to use more motor units. So strength can come from a larger number of motor units working together. We've learned that over, over time through experience. And I believe we talked about on page 372 how muscles can enlarge if you exercise them. Picking up heavier weights. As you look on page 372, figure 1027, we talked about the word hypertrophy. And you see when the muscle enlarges, it's because you are producing more myofibrils within each muscle cell. So the muscle grows, it gets larger because it has more myofibrils in it. Hi, Heather. Glad you're with us. Oh, just better cut. Just people. Leslie Thomas, you're not out there. And Shay Wheeler, you're not out there. No answer. I assume that's correct. Jessica Shelley. Okay, so we were on page 374 in your textbook. And we were looking at visceral muscle. Remember, visceral tells you where it's located. Can you name some organs which contain visceral muscle. Good, Stephen, that's correct. Rihanna, that's correct. Can anybody think of another organ which has visceral muscle composing its walls? Who 
Okay, Jasmine, let's uh, let's do this. The kidney is not made, really made of muscle, but the ureter that comes out of the kidney to carry urine down to the bladder, the ureter, you got two of them. All of us were born with two for the most part. Um, the ureter has visceral muscle in it, but the kidney itself doesn't. So just make that adjustment. You're in the right area. Uh, Heather, that's right. The stomach, Stephen, that's right. All the esophagus, good. The bladder, very good. Very good, Lace. The bladder's got visceral muscle also. And think of all the blood vessels that you have in your body. You've got something over 60,000 miles of blood vessels. The arteries have thicker blood, mess, blood vessels. The, the veins have thinner, did I say thicker blood vessels? They are thicker, but they have a thicker muscle layer, whereas the veins have a thinner muscle layer. So we've got a lot of visceral muscle in our body. And you're right, Paul, that esophagus is one of those organs. So as you look on page 374, You look at the picture down below, figure 1028. Should see a cross section of the intestine. And notice that you have two layers of visceral muscle. One layer has its fibers running with, in this case, the intestine. And the other layer like a hand around a hose. So that's circular visceral muscle. The outer layer is longitudinal visceral muscle. So these two layers contract, not simultaneously, they alternate. So one of them is going to shorten the intestine. The ones that are longitudinal fibers, it's going to make the small intestine shorter. And then the one that goes around is going to decrease the diameter. So between the two of them, they move food through our GI tract. One shortens the intestine. The other one constricts the diameter or decreases the diameter of the intestine. That occurs in the stomach. It occurs in the small intestine. It occurs in the large intestine. Takes about 24 hours, maybe a little less, for food to get through the GI tract. A couple of things about visceral muscle. How is visceral muscle different from skeletal muscle? How is visceral muscle different from skeletal muscle? Okay, visceral muscle is involuntary. That's correct. I'm sure I'm glad we can concentrate on other things while our GI tract's doing the work. Mm -hmm. Good. This rule is involuntary. This rule is voluntary. Anything else? Okay, Akenya, this rule muscle looks um, smooth. That would be its appearance. You would not see striations. Good, Brooke, it lacks striations. See, these are questions that can show up on your test. So you want to know those things. That's good. I'm glad you're seeing these. 
And Stephen, you're correct. The um, single nucleus in the visceral muscle, in a muscle cell, whereas in a skeletal muscle, multinucleated cells. That's correct, Stephen. Skeletal has striation. Smooth muscles do not. If you, you do not have to read this, okay? But if you get curious and want to wonder about it a little bit, as you look on page 374, the second column, you see a structure of smooth muscle cells. Very interesting arrangement within the cell. Still has actin, still has myosin. There's some other things that are missing. But you read that and you'll, uh, you'll say, my, my, my. Not the easiest thing to picture. Smooth muscle doesn't have any of those striations because the, the actin and the myosin are not uh, arranged in that fashion. That's amazing. So we don't have to control it. And it'll slowly crush uh, the food that we eat, mix it with the juices, and push it on through. Uh, isn't it great to eat a good meal? And then you don't have to worry about it. You can just go to sleep afterwards. Jessica, good. Glad you're here, Jessica Schelling. I can change that now. Let's see. Thank you. Leslie Thomas, you haven't come in yet, have you? Shea Walker, Wheeler, excuse me, Shea Wheeler. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Not going to hold you accountable for how the filaments are arranged in visceral muscle or how they contract or anything. Just knowing the difference is okay at this point. So we are now finished with chapter 10. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted us to know. I don't think so. So we're going to go over to chapter 11. In my textbook, it's 381. This is another amazing system in the body. Some of it seems fairly simple. Others of it will, uh, you have to chew on it. Think about it in order to gain some degree of understanding of it. Now, as you, as you look on page 382, Page 382. You look at figure 11.1. You see the young man with all those little yellow lines going down his arms, around his chest, down his legs, and so forth. And you probably know if you took 110, if you didn't, maybe you're not real sure about it, but um, there are two components to the nervous system, two divisions, as it were, and then we're going to have some subdivisions. So as you look at that picture, you see on the left, you see CNS, which is the central nervous system. And you see the two structures that compose the central nervous system. So you want to know the brain and the spinal cord. Both are encased in bone. Why is that?
Ah, that's right, Jessica Sessions. Protection. And they really do a pretty good job, don't they? All those vertebrae, although they allow us uh, to have movement. But that's why they're encased in bone. Uh, now, can you, uh, movement of the vertebral column, of course, that's muscular, musculoskeletal. But um, when you think about encased in bone, it's there for protection. So that's basically why those structures are in bone. And we can take some pretty hard knocks on the head and even in the back sometimes. And we keep on moving, keep on going. Sometimes we get whacked in the head and just get over it and keep on going. So the central nervous system. And then you look to the right and you see the PNS, peripheral nervous system. Now notice in the peripheral nervous system, this means it's going to come out to the perimeter, to the periphery, to the uh, edges of our body. And you can see the, the lines going to up around the head. Uh, you see cranial nerves. Kenya, you're going to be a dental hygienist, if I remember correctly. And you see those cranial nerves. Uh, we don't think too much about the cranial nerves, but uh, they're, they're value, uh, really very valuable to us. But Kenya, you know, one thing that the dentist does is work on those nerves, deadening those nerves, so that patient will not come out of the chair when he has to grind down a stump of the broken tooth so he can put a crown on it or whether they... Um, have to drill a hole to fill it with some sort of amalgam. I have a friend who, a lady friend over in Darlington, she's married to a fellow I go hunting with, and she can go into a dentist's office and the dentist can drill on her teeth without anesthesia. Mm. I get the shivers just thinking about that drill on my teeth. My teeth are so sensitive, or maybe they're just normal. But I'm so thankful for Novocaine and Lidocaine or whatever they use to, to deaden that, even if you come away with a fat lip. <laughs> Woo! Makes me just shudder to think about no. No Novocaine. So we got cranial nerves. Uh, you'll get to that a little bit later, uh, probably when you study some of the uh, accessory organs that we have. Uh, we'll look a little bit at the eye. And there's a cranial nerve that goes to the eye so that has receptors we can see, color receptors and light receptors and so forth. And then, of course, you can think about um, your hearing. There's another nerve that goes out to the structure that we'll look at. Both the eye and the ear are just incredibly complex. Hmm. Just fascinating to look at. And then you see all the other vessels that come down, um, come down the arms, come down the legs. And then you see vessels, that, uh, not vessels, <laughs> excuse me, Nerves that come off the spinal cord and they uh, innervate your uh, chest cavity, your muscles, your abdominal muscles, and so forth. So we have cranial nerves that come out and innervate various structures. And then we've got spinal nerves that come out. They're all part of the peripheral nervous system, whether it's peripheral on your face or whether it's peripheral all the way down to your fingertips. Those are all outside of the brain, even though they originate in the brain, they come out of the skull and you've got nerves that come out of the vertebral column. You probably have covered that in the, the, uh, the lab. 
You may have looked at, I think it's probably the lumbar vertebra that they have in there. They show a blown disc. It's usually painted kind of red. But you also saw nerves coming out between the vertebrae. You had the, what they call the intervertebral foramen. And that's where your spinal nerves, whether it's thoracic or lumbar, or, uh, come out. And you've got discs uh, separating those um, vertebrae. So, your nervous system com is composed of two divisions, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now, let's look for just a moment over on page 383. Look down at the bottom of page 383, and you see figure 11. So it gives you uh, another picture of the organization of the central nervous system. So you see up at the top, not the top of the page, but the top of the illustration, top of the figure, figure 11.3. You see the brain and spinal cord. And notice you've got an arrow going down on the right and an arrow coming up on the left. So what that's telling you is that some of the peripheral nerves, whether they're cranial or spinal, some bring messages to the brain. Some, the one over on the right shows you that they carry messages away from the brain toward parts of the body. So you've got that purple where it says PNS, peripheral nervous system. Look to the right, and you see it says motor division. Here's another division. So you, you have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now you're seeing that there's a subdivision. Motor makes you think of moving. Some people still use the word, uh, let's go motoring. And that means you hop in a car, turn the motor on, and you guide yourself to where you would like. Now, notice the term efferent. And efferent means away from. So these nerves that are highlighted with that sort of pinkish color, reddish color, those nerves carry messages away from the central nervous system. And as you look in the left box, it's sort of shaded red, light pink or whatever. You see it says the somatic motor division. So we're getting another division. It's part of the motor efferent division, but the somatic, as you see, goes to skeletal muscles. So as I'm talking, messages are traveling down those nerves, those efferent nerves, to my tongue, to my lips, to my respiratory tract, because I take breaths so that I can get the whole thought out in one breath. Shift in my chair, whatever, sit up straight. And then you look to the right and you see autonomic nervous system. Autonomic. Now, autonomic comes from a word 
known as autonomy. You can write that out in the right hand um, side of that page. A U T O N O M Y. Autonomy. Autonomy. Autonomy means independent. If some, something is autonomous, it is independent. That's one of the things that we value in America, a degree of autonomy. We don't have to choose to wear the same clothes everybody else does as they have done in other countries. Can't express your appreciation of color or mm, appearance in the sense of is it a plaid, is it a stripe, is it a polka dot or something like that. So that's, this nervous system is auto autonomous. In other words, we don't have conscious control over that system. So you see the signals go to something other than skeletal muscle. You see they go to visceral muscle, which is smooth in appearance. Some of the nerves go to the cardiac muscle. And some go to glands. And it's great that we don't have to think about it. It's set up so that it's going to work without us having to consciously handle so many changes in the environment that have an effect on our body. Frees us up to do some other things, not that these... Um, the activity of smooth of visceral muscle and cardiac muscle and glands, and we're not saying it's not important. It keeps us alive, to tell you the truth, but we don't have to think about that. We don't have to think about that. It's kind of nice. It frees us up to do other things. So that's the motor division. You move to the left, go back up to motor division. Go back to the PNS, cranial nerves and spinal nerves, and go to your left, and you see sensory afferent division. Afferent means going to. Efferent means going away. So these nerves, this division, consists of nerves that send messages to our central nervous system. So they go to the brain and spinal cord. So where you see sensory afferent division, go down below. And you see there is a somatic sensory division. And you see that picks up changes in our muscle. If it's getting stretched too much or squeezed too much, we're aware of it. Bones. I have never really looked this up, but there's a, a problem down towards Key West, I think it is, in Florida. There are mosquitoes down there that carry viruses. And when they bite people, they give the virus to a person and they get what they call dengue fever. Dengue fever, D-E-N-G-U-E. You don't have to know that. 
But one of the difficulties, one of the uncomfortable um, events when you have dengue fever is you feel like you're aching from your bones out. Very uncomfortable. And we've all probably had muscle aches before. Maybe like, um, you know, the flu. Some of you may have had the flu. I had the flu and my back ached, my shoulders ached, my hips, my knees ached. No fun. But that was muscle. But the dengue fever hurts from, it seems to hurt from within the bone. I had a friend of mine who, I think he's gone now, he's died, and he, uh, he was a veteran in Vietnam, and he got dengue fever over there from mosquitoes. Another good reason to make sure you don't have any standing water in your on your property, in the sense of uh, maybe pots or something like that, or a pail or whatever. You don't want to give those mosquitoes any place to breathe. They can create some problems. But you see there, it says from the skin also. Bones, joints, you know, if you got somebody's, if you caught an arm or something and, and you were hurt, bending that joint too far, you're going to be aware of it. They're going to pick up messages and they're going to transfer that to your head. And you're going to be concentrating on that component of your body. What can I do to free this joint so it doesn't hurt? Most of us are not into pain. I hope none of you are. As you look at the monitor, you see my face. And so you have sensory nerves that are picking up my image on the screen and taking that back to your brain so you know who you're looking at. Now, think for just a minute. Now, you know, we've got this test three, and that, we, we've got honor look, uh, honor lock. Uh, we signed a do document with them, and that's going to be used very soon. So, when they're going to get it on our D2L, I'm not real sure, but it sounds like it could be within a couple of days. So don't, we're not going to have a third test this week. It'll probably be next week. I've said that twice, haven't I? So go back over it. You guys should make A's on this third test. You've only had about a month to study for. Make my heart beat good. Make it beat good, okay? I enjoy seeing you guys succeed. I just got to beat you up a little bit along the way and make you work. Let me ask you something. As you look at the somatic sensory division, you notice it says skin. Can any of you bring to mind a receptor that you were responsible for? and was associated with the skin. Can you type that in now? You should be able to do it because you should be going over all of this stuff. Can anybody remember the name of that receptor that's associated with a stratum basal? See how we're tying this in to this new system that we're now going over? That's the whole purpose, because we work as a whole. All these systems work together. Come on, y'all taking too long. This is just loaded up on the internet. It's like those highways that are bumper to bumper traffic. Mm, tough. No term coming forth. Uh, 
Okay, now that's a muscle. That is a muscle. That's not a sensory nerve. That would be called an effector, and that erector pili would be over in the somatic division of the motor division. Think about a sensory structure that's going to pick up something in the environment or something if starts crawling across your hand or whatever. Oh, my, you guys should know that if you've been going over it. <laughs> That's correct. The uh, Yeah, the eye, the nerves in the eyes, we haven't gotten into that. We'll get to it a little bit later. I'm thinking about the skin in Chapter 5. Okay, that's uh, that is an effector. Y'all are dancing all around this thing. A gland is an effector. In other words, it's going to cause an effect. That's right, Stephen. It's a sensory receptor. Can you recall its name? It starts with the letter M. Man, this is like pulling teeth, isn't it? Mm, just not coming, is it? Well, get back in there and look at you. Might just see it. Mm -hmm. Supposed to know it. Okay. So we mentioned so somatic sensory. Ooh, Dominique, look at that big word in there. <laughs> oh, that's good, Dominique. Hey, now you got M-E-I-S-S-N-E-R apostrophe S Meissner's. Mm, seems like it has another little name attached to it. But anyway, you're correct. You're on the right track. Good job, Dominique. Okay, let's look at, uh, we're still looking at the somatic sensory division, and you know what it does now. So you look to the right, and you see visceral sensory division. So that would bring messages from your viscera, your internal organs. Ooh, very good, Dominique. Very good. So when you think about this visceral uh, sensory division, Think of hmm, think of your bladder, your urinary bladder. And most of you have been in the position, uh, maybe on a trip with your family, and uh, sometimes maybe in a long day. And you suddenly realize, oh, it's full. That's right. That's where this visceral sensory division would come in. That's just one example. But you would know that your bladder is full and you would start looking for a, a bathroom. How many of you have been nauseated? 
that comes from something in your GI tract, doesn't it? Now, you're made, of, made aware that there's a problem in the GI tract. You may have swallowed a bacterium and it's uh, grown at this point. And now it's going to make you uh, throw up. So these are visceral sensory um, cells that tell you, you got a problem. That'd be horrible, wouldn't it? Be just sitting there and all of a sudden, whoa! Out comes your lunch from two hours ago. It's nice, and it's not pleasant, but it's nice that you get this nauseating sensation. You think, oh, I need to get out of here. I don't want to throw this all over uh, the place. I remember when I was in the fifth grade, there was a little boy sitting in front of me, and he was not supposed to eat something that was on his plate in, uh, when we went to the lunchroom. He sat in front of me, and there was a girl that sat in front of him. <laughs> and I guess he tried to hold his upset stomach, but he just vomited all in the back of her hair. <laughs> Uh, it was, you know, you would all be laughing, but you'd be thinking, oh, my, it was something else. Whew. So, when you, gotta, when you feel nauseated, you know you got to get to the bathroom so you don't dump it on somebody's head. All right, so you got the division there. So, uh, you know about the difference, the words um, efferent and afferent? And remember, the autonomic system means independent. Don't get it confused with the word automatic. It might, it's going to respond to a situation without you really having to think about it, but it's independent, okay? Did I mention that you had 37 miles of nerves in your body? 37 miles. That's about like going to Bennettsville and back, isn't it? Maybe Society Hill and back. Any questions about that chart? All right, so let's look at the lady up top on that same page. We want to think, we've talked about the physical division of the nervous system, central and peripheral and so forth. So you look at that picture of the lady with the soccer ball and you see it says functions of the nervous system. And you see sensory input. And boy, that's happening all the time, isn't it? Isn't it? You walk outside at 6.30 in the morning or whenever you get up to um, go get the paper, and you sense the environment, don't you? Ooh, boy, need to wear a coat for a while today. It's going to be cool. Or you walk outside in the middle of July, and it's 85 degrees, and the humidity is 85%. You walk out, and you just go, oh, it just oppresses you. So the sensory portion of our nervous system gives us feedback as to what the environment is like. Just like it gives us the um, sense of our, say our GI tract again, that everything's okay or everything's not okay. That's sensory input. And then the second function is what they call integration And this is where 
uh, decision making occurs. How are you going to handle this situation? How do you respond to it? This would be involved in uh, a thinking, making a decision. Of course, we we grow in our um, decision making. At least we should. We begin to store information. So that's the second function of integration that would involve decision making. And then you see uh, by her uh, coming down her hip and down her leg, you see motor and output. That's a response. to a change in the environment. Now that again is um, internal and external. So when we, um, let's say, uh, well, you know, I looked up, my son and I were out there grilling one day a couple of weeks ago. We looked out across the fence and here comes this coyote just loping along. I said, my son says, is that a fox? I said, no, that's a coyote. And we have them around our house. I haven't seen but one or two of them. That's really one or two too many for me. Like sometimes they can carry rabies. And sometimes if you got um, pets, you know, little dogs like chihuahuas, those coyotes will come up and eat them. But anyway, that would be environmental. But if we um, if we walk outside in December and it's 32 degrees outside and we've only got a short sleeve shirt on, we go back in maybe and get a jacket. So we respond to the environment, but we also respond to uh, to what's going on inside us. So you got sensory input, integration, and output, motor output. Any questions so far on that generalized function? Then let's turn over to Page 385, actually it'd be about 384. So we're going to look at neurons first, and we won't we won't finish over into the uh, supporting cells, but as you Look on page 384, the second column, you see neurons. And I want you to come down into that paragraph. Starts off the billions of neurons and nerve nervous tissue directly responsible for its sensory, integrative, and motor functions. Neurons are the excitable cell type. The excitable cell type for sending and receiving signals in the form of action potentials. So that's a definition for a neuron. It's the excitable cell type responsible for sending and receiving signals and the signals are in the form of action potentials. Same thing as a nerve impulse. So there's your definition. Now, I want you to look at the next sentence. 
It says, recall that most neurons are amitotic. And you can see that means that they do not reproduce as our skin cells do. You can see they lose their centrioles. Now, we don't have an answer for that. Don't ever think science has got it figured out. We know a little bit. Know enough to help people. Know enough to help you guys. You get a degree, you can go in and help people and make a living. It's good. Good for you. You help people. That's nice. And you make a living. That's nice, too. That's why I'm still here. I have a lot of fun with you guys. So they lose their centrioles. And of course, those would produce the spindle fibers, which they can't produce anymore, so you can't pull away um, the uh, chromatids. So sometimes you damage it and it's gone. Now, what we want to do is... Uh, Take a look on page 385. And there you see a really nice illustration of a neuron. So you want to circle dendrites. This is figure 11.5. We'll talk about their function in just a couple of minutes. You see the cell body. That's what that yellow structure is, basically. Looking inside. Got some stuff you already know about. Nucleus. Purple structure. Mitochondria. Produces ATP, and these guys need quite a bit of mitochondria because they're always sending messages. Come down under mitochondria, uh, mitochondria on, that's a singular one. Missile bodies, and you see in parenthesis there, ribosomes. And that's Some of those ribosomes are free. Ribosomes and rough ER, which means some of those ribosomes are on the endoplasmic particular. And you already know those ribosomes and the endoplasmic reticulum play a role in making what? What did the ribosomes and the ER get involved in making, producing? How about it, Nathan? You've been nice and quiet in there. How about it, Nathan? Can you think of it? What do the ER and the ribosomes play a role in making? Bro, did he give you that answer? I was hoping Nathan would answer it. I hope he gave it to you so you could get, speak for it. Maybe he's, he's shy today. Anyway, that's correct. They're making proteins. You see the little green structure? That's They don't have it labeled, but that's a Golgi apparatus. And then you want to know this component as you look, um, you're looking at the cell body and you move, say, from the nucleus to the right, you see a little circle going around, a little extension. They call that the axon hillock. And you see axolema. What is the axolema composed of? That's fine, Ashley. Appreciate your presence today. You have a good afternoon.
just be careful. Stay out of people's face and keep your hands out of your face. Don't want to hear you got the coronavirus, even though you're young and strong. Thank you for letting me know. What is the axolema composed of? <laughs> How about it, Jessica Se uh, Sessions? What is the axolema composed of? Kenya. What kind of a bilayer? That's that's just, that's what it looks like structurally. What's it made out of chemically? Jessica Sessions, are you still online? Come on, beat a Kenya to the to the button, so to speak. He's on the right track. <laughs> That's okay. I appreciate your honesty. Well, think about this. We just got through with muscles. And what is a sarcolemma? Stephen, can you help him out? Stephen Bass, can you help him out? What is a sarcolemma, Stephen? Thank you, Steve. It's the membrane of a muscle cell. So if a sarcolemma is the membrane of a muscle cell, it, the out, membrane's on the outer side, so you really don't need that word outer, Steve. But, but Jessica, think about this. If a sarcolemma is the cell membrane, the axolemma would be the cell membrane of a neuron. See, just put those connections together. That's going to make you smarter. You're going to be able to say, okay, well, if this is this, then this is this. That's what they call a little bit of thinking, see? Trying to get you to do that. Now, that cell membrane, Stephen, is on the, it encloses all the myofibrils that are inside it. We just call it, it's the cell membrane of the muscle. Just when you think of cell membranes, you might think of squamous cells that we talked about, cuboidal cells and so forth. And in muscles, well, they call it a sarcolemma as opposed to the cell membrane, but it's still the cell membrane, phospholipid bilayer. Okay? And you come over to the right past axolemma, and you have the term axon. And you follow that axon as it curves around and you come to this structure that we might have mentioned when we were um, looking at the synapse, the myoneural junction, where the nerve and the muscle connected with each other. You see, remember the little branches and you had little knobs on the end? Well, those little 
uh, extensions are called telodendria. And you look to the left and you see axon terminal. That's that bulbous little end that we looked at, which was right next to the sarcolemma. Remember, they don't touch each other. There's a little fluid called a synaptic cleft, a little space in there. So you got telodendria. Those are branches of the axon. And they end in a little enlargement that they call an axon terminal. So from looking at the diagram, figure 1115, in general, you can say there's usually one axon, but a number of dendrites. So in wrapping this up, look down at the bottom of page 385. You see where it says processes, dendrites, and axons? Under that first little paragraph, you see the last sentence in that processes of dendrites and axons. Most neurons have two types of processes one or more dendrites, and one axon. As you come into dendrites, Highlight that in the textbook or take a note. They receive input from other neurons. Remember that little uh, corpuscle you were talking about, Dominique? Meissner's corpuscle? That would pick up an environmental uh, event, some sort of change in the environment, and it would connect with a dendrite that would go to a cell body, and then an axon, in that case, would go into the um, central nervous system and make you aware of a change in the environment. So dendrites carry a message and action potential to the cell body. And the last thing we want to mention is on page 386, you see axon the word axon. Now notice in the second line, and we're somewhat going to stick with this. Traditionally, uh, an axon was defined as a process that carried a signal away from the cell body. That has been the traditional understanding. However, you see it says the axons of certain neurons can carry a message both toward and away from the cell body.
for our basic understanding, axons are going to carry a message away from the cell body. Dendrites are going to can, uh, carry the message to the cell body. Any questions? Okay, well, we are all through unless you have no questions. As soon as they get on or lock in, we will get on with a test. Test number three, chapter five and chapter six. Know it. Make me smile. Okay. All right, I'm going to end this. I look forward to seeing you Wednesday afternoon. Keep your hands out of your face. Six foot distance. I want to read about you. Okay. Bye-bye.